Here's the diagonally impaired knight. He can move to a location in his west-northwest, west-southwest, south-southwest, or south-southeast. He might have arrived here from a location in the east-southeast, east-northeast, north-northeast, or north-northwest. Let's now find his Grundy tables. On a rectangular board, his mobility is sometimes restricted by the northern or eastern boundaries. So we start with a triangular board, which has no such restrictions. This quadrilateral board would also work, as would an infinite quarter plane whose only boundaries are on the board's southern and western edges. In IHS 2, we found this pattern of locations from which the next player to move cannot win the standalone game against a good opponent. These are all the locations and the only locations which have a Grundy number of zero. From any blank square on the bottom row, there is only one move. The destination is zero, so the location from which that move originates has Grundy number one. Since the knight's moves are diagonally symmetric, the numbers along any row can be reflected across the main diagonal to the corresponding column. Here's the reflection of the southernmost row, which we're calling row zero, across to the westernmost column. Let's look next at the row we've labeled as row two. Every blank square on this row has moves south, southeast, and south, southwest to row zero. One of these moves goes to zero, the other to one. Hence, every square on row two has Grundy number greater than one. In this video, we'll call such values big. This property can also be reflected across the diagonal. We next consider row one. Every blank square in this row has two legal moves, south-southwest to a zero, or west-northwest to a checkmark of value greater than one. So its Grundy number is one. We now notice that for the rows we've labeled zero and one, if we're located more than one square past the diagonal, then the row is periodic with period four. The ones on row two can also be reflected across the diagonal. Let's now examine row three. The square on the diagonal of this row has followers of zero and other followers which are big, so its Grundy number is one. Every subsequent square on row three has two followers on row one, which have values zero and one in some order. So each such square has a big Grundy number. And so does the corresponding column. Although locations more than one square past the diagonal on rows four and five have followers on rows two and three, those followers are too big to affect the values. So those followers on row four are the same as the corresponding values on row zero. Similarly, row 6 behaves as row 2. It reflects. Row 5 behaves as row 1, and it also reflects. The entry on the main diagonal of row 7 is a 1, but the rest of the entries on that row must be bigger, as are their reflections. Let's now go back and examine the entry just after the diagonal on row 1. It has only two moves, two zero and one, so its value is two. But this argument doesn't yet work on the corresponding square adjacent to the diagonal on row five because it has followers on row three. If either of those followers had value two, then its value would be bigger than the two on row one. So we need to resolve the values of the check marks on rows two and three. The next entry in row two is three, 
as is its reflection. The next entry in row 3 is 4, as is its reflection. There can be no more 4s in rows 3. That's because every subsequent square has a west-northwest follower of value 0 or 1, which duplicates one of the values found to the south-southwest or south-southeast. So these four locations have only three distinct values, and to get a max of four requires four distinct values, namely 0, 1, 2, and 3. Similarly, there can be no fours in row 2. So in rows 2 and 3, the values of the check marks must alternate between 2 and 3, with each reverse knight's move going either east northeast or east southeast. Here's one such set. Here's another. And another. And here's the last such set. Having completed rows 1 and 3, we now observe that each of those rows has a unique maximum value which occurs just after the diagonal. So let's highlight the thickened main diagonal, which includes these exceptional values. Once we've passed them, row 2 becomes periodic with period 4. So does row 3. For every row with label less than 4, once we've passed the thickened diagonal, the row becomes periodic. We next review the question mark on row 5. Since its followers are 1, 0, 3, and 3, its value is 2. This value agrees with the comparable entries on rows 2 and 3. It ensures that when we complete rows 6 and 7 and their diagonal reflections, all of the same arguments and initial conditions we saw on rows 2 and 3 apply again and yield the same answers. The L-shaped pattern with four lanes can be repeated again and again until we have tiled the entire board. Every row is periodic. Here's the equation for the first repetition of the L-shaped pattern. Here's the equation for the jth repetition. These red boxes show its application when x equals 8, y equals 2, and j is 0 or 1. Here's the same sequence when j equals 22 and 23. Every diagonal has period 4. This includes those on or before the thickened main diagonal. After the thickened diagonal, every row also has period 4. As shown in this triangle, that implies that below the thickened diagonal, every column also has period 4. These equalities do not depend on the particular values they cover. The triangle can be translated anywhere on the same side of the thickened diagonal. It can be reflected across the thickened diagonal. It proves that on either side of the thickened diagonal, the values in every row are periodic with period 4.